There's a remarkable thing about the public library. If you go to the public library to learn about something and you do it with paper books, it's the only instance in which you can learn in our society today when, in which you aren't under observation. It's the last place where you can have private learning. There, there was this culture like 10, 10 years and more ago where people would get together online and obsess about something like instruments and they would just do it without some big company aggregating them and spying on them all the time. And now uh, Facebook and other services have sucked all that up so that if you want to enjoy like connecting with people, you have to do it within the system where you're being observed and modeled and you have to do it through the structures of the system and you have to accept the rules of the system. You know, the truth is you, you end up pulling the whole community into this other system for somebody else's benefit. You're no longer and I, creating it, a private it community. It doesn't feel the same. Yeah. It really doesn't feel the same. Zadie Smith captures something quite magnificent when she says, it feels important to remind ourselves at this point that Facebook, our new beloved interface with reality, was designed by a Harvard sophomore with a Harvard sophomore's preoccupation. What is your relationship status? Choose one. There can only be one answer. People need to know. Do you have a life? Prove it. Post pictures. <laughs> Do you like the right sort of things? Make a list. Things like will include movies, music, books, and television, but not architecture, ideas, or plans. But here I feel I am becoming nostalgic. I am dreaming of a web that caters to a kind of person who no longer exists, a private person, a person who is a mystery to the world and which is more important to herself. I, I don't have any objection to the Facebook design per se, but it's, it's just like with the Wikipedia, the notion that there's this one dominant thing that everybody has to do. There should be a diversity of them. We should seek a society of cognitive diversity and social diversity, and this, this slamming of everything into the same model creates a fake diversity where everything, there, there's like a lot of different kinds of topics, but they all are kind of made more and more similar because they all follow the same pattern, and so we actually lose the flavor gradually. Right now, in order to use a Google Glass or in order to sign up for Facebook at all, you have to go all the way. You have to say, okay, you got all my data. And you, you, can, you can tweak privacy settings a bit, but they're always changing them and nobody really understands them and then they always turn out to be breached anyways. It's an all or nothing thing. And what we would really like is shades of gray. You'd really like to be able to say, well, I'll share some data and I want to get some benefit, but I want to kind of be a bit shy about it. What we're doing by making information free is we're giving the government infinite license to spy. See, if, yeah, if, if your data was worth something and the NSA had to pay you for it, they'd have to temper themselves. And if they wanted to steal your data, then they, they would face the one, the one force that's even greater, which is the accountants. Accounting could create a, an order in the use of data and an, a, a gray area where data is used a little bit. And then people, what, the way I imagine is you could set your price. If you want to be really private, you just make your data expensive. And if you want to, if you want to participate a lot, and, and there would be some benefits, there are always trade-offs in any decision, then you'd be able to make your data cheaper. But it would give you, it would give you a method to regulate it that's very simple, that's not this very complicated secret code, but is really just one number, which is a price.